want to establish the context of today's call, which is uh, the 27th of uh, July, uh, 2018. It is uh, the full moon of the month of July, which in India is dedicated to the Guru. Um, the Guru is the representation of our own highest wisdom, our own highest knowing. Uh, the power available to us that guides us, that protects us, that is a mentor to us uh, at all times. That power is that Shakti, that power is called uh, Guru. And um, 5,000 years ago, uh, Ved Vyas, who is the author of the Vedas and the Mahabharat, uh, he is supposed to have been born this day. And therefore, this country celebrates all teachers uh, as he was one of India's greatest teachers. So this is the Guru Purnima. And I imagine many of you have had the good fortune of having good teachers. And you know that if it weren't for some of these teachers and mentors, and sometimes one particular special mentor teacher in your life, you would not be where you are today. You would not be who you are today. And this would not be a father or a mother or a friend. This would actually be um, some kind of a mentor. Uh, it's, it's the Gandalf to Frodo in Lord of the Rings. Mm. Um, and I have been very fortunate to have had these kinds of mentor gurus in my life. And my connection to Canada and my guru is very special because I came all the way from Hong Kong in 2003 to Valmorin in the Laurentian Mountains to do my month-long Shivananda Yoga teacher training certification. So I trained as a yoga teacher in Canada and accepted uh, Swami Shivananda as my, my guru when it comes to yoga. And on this day, every year, his one sentence just zings home to me every time, where he says, eating, sleeping, drinking, a little laughter, much weeping. Is that all? Don't die here like a worm. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up and attain immortal bliss. So every time I hear those words, it wakes me up. It reminds me that we are not here to die like worms. You know, we're all these potential butterflies. Uh, who have to find this uh, bliss inside ourselves, who have to find this totally uh, different level of capacity and being uh, what we unashamedly in India just call the divine. You know, that we all have that spark in us and we, we, do, we don't want to go die before we have found that and become a channel of that and embodied that and manifested that fully. So... Today is the day where each of us on this full moon day can connect with the power of the mentor teacher in your life as a field of energy rather than a person. And you can connect with the full moon. There are these beautiful rays of moonlight coming upon you today, drenching this whole planet today. And this field is very alive and active in your, according to yogic tradition. And so even if we take a little bit of effort to open to this field of our own higher knowing, our own uh, highest guidance and protection, if we know how to open to that simply by asking for it, by being in very sincere and humble surrender to that greater capacity to come in and grace us and to lift us and to take us over, then much can happen on this night. So today is Guru Purnima, and uh, Purnima simply means the full moon. And um, it's an eclipse. It's going to be the century's longest eclipse. And we finish this call, and about 15 minutes as we finish, the eclipse actually begins. So what I would love with the next few minutes I have is to take us into a state of presence and a state of receptivity so that we can all connect with the, the power of 
the, the teacher in us, the, the, the divine guidance in us. Would you like that? Okay. So settle down where you are and feel very grounded. Either keep your feet on the floor or be cross-legged. But just adjust yourself so both your sit bones are feeling very nicely cradled by the seat you are on. It could be the ground, it could be your mat, it could be the cushion. But just feel Mother Earth rising through that and really holding you so that it's as if your hips are cradled uh, by Mother Earth. You know, you are sitting in good connection with this ground of being. Straighten your spine and make yourself as tall as you can. You can gently maneuver your spine until you feel nice and straight and tall. Not in a stiff kind of way, but in a relaxed way. Keep your head and neck in alignment with your spine. And then bring your right hand to your breastbone and start tapping there. Tapping as if you are knocking on a gateless gate, which separates your ordinary self and your ordinary heart that can get polarized. And inside, beyond this gateless gate, is your true sacred heart the Ridhaya Guham, the cave of the heart, where the Antar Atma resides, the soul spark, the immanent divine self, the divine presence resides. So keep tapping on your heart center and then gently cover your heart with your palm and you bring your, right hand, your left hand to your belly. And you're going to chant with me the mantra Om Ma. Om simply means consciousness. It's the vibration of the ground of consciousness. And Ma is the divine feminine, the power that creates and evolves the universe. So this is not a religious mantra. It is pure Sanskrit. It's just a language. Om Ma. If you're happy to do that, just join me. If you would rather not, just allow yourself to feel the vibrations of the ground of being, pure consciousness, and the creative, energetic ground, which is the Divine Mother, the feminine presence. Okay, so we begin. You can follow me. Oh, Soften your heart, moisten your heart and relax it open. And like a child, come home with a simplicity and a sincerity and a trust. Visualize or imagine that you're entering a sacred cave. It's a vast inner chamber inside your own sacred heart. And there is a pillar of fire that goes through your spine, that rises from the supreme source above and anchors through your spine all the way down into the center of Mother Earth below. And in this pillar of fire at the center of your sacred heart is the presence of the Divine Mother or your own divine teacher. You have asked and called 
for that presence and it has responded. And just allow its entry be as soft and open as you can be, as curious as you can be. And allow yourself to feel a warmth. Enter your heart and start radiating out from there. If you wish, you can visualize a presence. It could be your own highest self. It could be the Divine Mother in whatever form or shape you relate to. It could be a guide. You have always known or maybe are meeting for the first time. Just know that this is the embodiment of the power of your own highest wisdom and guidance. And this presence welcomes you home with wide open arms. So like a child come home, step in to this warm embrace and allow your whole self to melt into the fire of this heart of love and wisdom and compassion. And allow your whole self to start melting and merging into your own highest expression of love and wisdom and compassion. And keep breathing. Gathering your whole self in and up into your heart fire. And then exhaling, receiving this higher presence down and out into your whole body, breath and mind complex. So you inhale, you gather yourself in and up. And you exhale, you receive your higher self down and out into this whole body, mind and breath complex. Keep doing this until you feel your higher self and your ego self perfectly integrated and harmonized and a wonderful sense of being fully embodied and present as your own Guru Shakti, your own wisdom and power. While you are in this state, always remember to hold on to a sense of sincerity, humility, and gratitude. This is your safety net. Do not fall into the abuse of this power. And when you're ready, gently bring both your hands together in a prayer position at the heart, and you bow down your head as if bowing to that divine fire, the presence in your own heart, asking that it stay with you for the rest of this session and beyond. And that the benefit of this experience accrue to all sentient beings for the highest good of all. Deep breath, gently open your eyes. Stefan, you are on mute. I would invite you uh, in your time to take this over. We can have a conversation. Feel free to ask me the questions. Yeah, so uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to take over. Thank you so much, Nilima. It's exactly what I, I needed. <laughs> I'm sure everyone uh, benefited. 
So the first thing, uh, I'm going to ask the first question and then I'll invite our guests to uh, ask their questions. Could you um, share uh, briefly, in your opinion, the power, uh, sorry, the importance of the feminine rise? You know, for me, it is life-changing. It is absolutely needed. Can you share a bit your thoughts on that? And why do we need to put so much focus on that? Um, with the Me Too movement, and there's so much going on on this subject right now, uh, that a lot has already been said. But uh, in a nutshell, I think it's become obvious that uh, for about 2,000 years and even more, depending on who you ask, um, between men and women, men have been given the power over women and this decision making for what all decisions that uh, apply to society and communities, the power has been in the hands of men and it's called the patriarchy. Versus once upon a time, apparently there used to be a matriarchy where apparently women had the power of decision making because they had the power of giving life. Uh, so they were closer to the divine as givers of life and therefore they were given power. And in esoteric circles, the story goes that eventually women abused that power over men and therefore there was a backlash and um, this happened in prehistoric times, apparently. Uh, I don't know how true this is, but it makes sense to me. And that's when men had to uh, just stand up for themselves and take the power back. Uh, but then the shoe went on the other foot, which is now the men had power over women. And that is something that has been around for the longest time in history, unless you're reading about the Cretan civilization and so on. So the patriarchy has led to um, not just in inequ uh, inequity and inequality. So it's, it's not just that in today's more enlightened age that it's becoming obvious that things are unequal amongst gender and that women need equal rights, opportunities, and status as just a moral and ethical thing, right? But it's also becoming obvious, if you look at it in, in very simple um, Eastern frameworks of yin and yang or Shiva and Shakti, that for every system to be in a state of health, it needs to be in a state of dynamic equilibrium of these two forces of the masculine and the feminine. And when one force uh, becomes a hyper expression and subdues and denies the other, then the entire system suffers. Mm. So if we look at all our societal um, systems out there today, you know, whether it's economy or technology or you know, the environment or business or politics, you look across health, education, you look across all domains and you will notice they are in some form of a crisis. It's like uh, the way they work simply isn't working anymore. And they're all, and each one thinks their crisis is unique to them. But if you diagnose it in a very simple um, Eastern health uh, diagnostic model, which is to say, check the level of yin and yang in the system, and it's basically, it's hyper yang and it's uh, hypo yin. You know, it's hyper masculine and not enough feminine. So it's not about justice anymore. It is really about health at a very fundamental level, health of a system for it to be sustainable. So even as a leader, um, masculine qualities, whether you're man or woman, it's masculine qualities that have been overvalued and feminine uh, qualities have been invisible and not measured and not rewarded. And so as a result, both men and women and all genders seek to embody a leadership model that they think is going to get rewarded. And that is a masculine leadership model. Mm. And so everyone brings on qualities like, you know, strength and confidence and direction and uh, getting the job done, you know, task focus, which is all excellent. But if it is done to the neglect of including the team and taking the team along, having a people orientation, making sure every person in the team is engaged 
and is aligned with your vision, uh, is supporting it, um, having a sense of collaboration, having a sense of win-win, right? So uh, if we haven't taken along those very powerful and necessary complementary feminine qualities, which include creativity, compassion, uh, collaboration, uh, care, empathy, just a whole bunch of things that today all leadership books are telling you, like, that's what's needed. You know, these are qualities. Um, they're not saying those are feminine. They're simply calling those qualities that are needed for good leaders and in good leadership. So uh, essentially, it's the patriarchy that has not valued and rewarded um, feminine qualities and behaviors, feminine values and behaviors. And uh, as a result, the whole system's out of whack. And we just need to elevate these feminine values and behaviors across all domains and especially in leadership to return to balance, to restore balance. And um, the other thing that then happens is not just do you restore balance, but as I say in my book, um, the, 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 the bigger prize is actually to come into your full agency, your full power. And if you're only, it's like a bird flying on only one wing. If you're only flying on your masculine wing and you haven't extended your feminine wing, then you're going around in circles, you're having to work extra hard and you're not really getting where you want to go to. So to come into your full power, you need to extend both these polarities. You need to express them. You need to cultivate them. You need to uh, master them to a next level. Um, and then a third power, which is the power of presence itself, you know, the full power of Shakti, which is the innate force of evolution uh, kicks in. And then it's like you have wind beneath your wings and you're flying on a different supply now. You know, it's not even coming from your own striving and effort. So that higher power that's called Shakti in the yogic system is called the divine feminine because in the yogic system, the divine masculine is Shiva, which is pure consciousness, pure awareness. But by itself, it is just witness and sterile. It's still for it to create and to drive change and to evolve and to become and manifest the, the multiplicity, it needs the creative force like the mother gives birth and creates. So it needs the creative aspect. The creative aspect of Shiva is called Shakti. And it is, it is the fuel of, of existence. That is the creative aspect of existence that creates and fuels it. And therefore it's called the feminine. What's very fascinating is that it's an archetypal power. It is transpersonal and personal and everything in between. And it's intelligent. So in the yogic system, we actually understand that we can enter into relationship with this power. It's not some inanimate thing. It is almost sentient. So you can actually, it's like, Luke Skywalker being told by Yoda, you know, use the force, Luke, use the force, you know. It is indeed that. It's exactly that. The force in Star Wars is Shakti. And it is a responsive field. You can engage with it. It engages back. You move towards it. It moves towards you. And over time, you actually enter into a wonderful relationship of a child as to a mother. Thank you so much for all this wisdom. So I'd like to open it up for comments and questions from all our guests. I have many more questions, but I have a chance to know Nalima, so I, I can ask him another time. So anyone is welcome to ask questions now uh, live or through the chat. Uh, okay, I can start. <laughs> uh, right. Thank you very much for that. So, um, so I love this idea and I also really love the idea of, um, you know, things coming into balance are also just really being cognizant of polarities. Yes. So, um, you know, I see this even with things like um, KPIs or business metrics, you know, sometimes organizations often oscillate between overcorrections, you know, they kind of 
they incense something very heavily one way and then two years later we're reorging and we're incensing it the other way and a lot of it has to do with sort of that incomplete thinking around um, around the polarity of these things and really just getting those right kind of dynamics in place. But what I struggle with a little bit uh, is the, what, what I would say is sort of the biases. So number one, I think labeling things more feminine or masculine also carries a certain amount of resistance, I find both from women and men, because it just sort of feels like a foreign way to describe values, right? These values are often shared. But also, I find that we, we bias certain values. We are historically, we've, you know, we've sort of, we've, we've, we've had a hierarchy of values implicitly that often, that often is a bit of a subconscious barrier to really equally valuing you know, both sides of this. So I guess my question is, sorry, that was a long soliloquy, is um, what have you found in terms of, um, like, let me just take maybe an example of growth versus sustainability, right? So we talk about those being growth and sustainability are, you know, arguably should be equal values, right? Or they should, and yet we see that growth really dominates you know, if I at the end of a year of performance review talk about what I grew, how I grew the company versus how I made the company more sustainable, one, it often the growth will get more play. So how do you deal a little bit with sort of these uh, helping people, I guess, um, challenge their biases around the hierarchy of values? So I'd like to answer your question at two levels. Uh, one is, uh, you know, your question is a very uh, work related and, you know, let's not get into the deeper uh, psychology of this and so on. But uh, the work of Dr. Barry Johnson uh, around polarities, I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, he has really created a brilliant tool called polarity mapping, where he says, it's not about the either or, it's about the both and, and it's about getting to the end. So he has a very simple four quadrant process where you would look at the upsides of growth and the upsides of sustainability. You would look at the downside of focusing only on growth to the neglect of sustainability or the downside of focusing only on sustainability to the neglect of growth. And then you see how to catch yourself from falling below the line into the worst of both worlds. And what are the action steps you can take to remain in the healthy um, Mobius strip of the best of both worlds, which are the higher two quadrants? So I would say just go look that work up. Uh, they're, they're very available and, you know, you could take that forward. But once you have seen a polarity map of these two interdependent pairs, you can't unsee it. <laughs> so... Once you've actually plotted that map and you can see this is what I get when I'm focusing on growth and this is what I get when I'm focusing on sustainability. And actually, I can't focus on one to the neglect of the other. Once you've seen that, you're not going to be able to fall into the lower quadrant after that. I mean, you'd have to be practicing a lot of self-deception, <laughs> right? So that's, the, that's a, a, you know, a, a more practical answer. But I want to go back to something you said before you got into your question, which is that that even the words masculine and feminine have a loaded charge. And I would stop right there saying that loaded charge is precisely what we need to pause and unpack and breathe deeply and very uh, uh, from a place of presence and from a place of courage and compassion to understand why, what about this are we resisting? Because right there, is the problem of the unconscious bias. And if, if we don't really go there, we, we continue to throw babies out of bath waters, you know, with the bath water. Um, if we keep uh, throwing away language because it bothers us, we will not be left with language at the end of the day. So what we have to do is actually understand why are we having this disproportionate reaction to the words? And if you go deeply into that, um, it's my sense 
that we will discover the patriarchal wound from both sides because this denial of the feminine and uh, uh, the rejection and the anger at the feminine uh, goes so deep that we have now got angry with these words as well. And until we heal that wound and we learn to fully integrate this lost part of our individual and collective psyche, which is our feminine side, we are not going to progress. So, you know, wanting to sweep it under the carpet and saying, forget the words, let's just call it values, let's just call it something else. You may get some interim answers, but uh, the real long-term solution is to reintegrate the lost feminine. Thank you. I would love to say something. Sure. <clears throat> am, I, am I on? Is that, can I speak, Stefan? Yes, Eric, you're yes. welcome to speak. All right. Uh, I, I, I have not found one word that you have said that I disagree with. Not one word. And um, I believe deeply that we can't give up the discussion of masculine and feminine. And if if those words are so offensive to people and they get triggered, then you can use the chalice and the blade or the line and the circle, I don't care. But it is about fundamentally different qualities in the universe, in human beings, without regard to gender, that are very, very important to discuss, that all have different levels of maturity. And there's, there's, there's different levels of maturity. But when you were just talking about that, the challenge, because I'm, you know, I've been a, a clinical psychologist for 35 years, so I've been in the belly of the beast of, of the issues of men and women. I treat about half men, so. Um, and what, what is up is that men's, connection with the feminine and females starts with their mothers and starts at an unconscious level. They can't even verbalize or access it. And the fact is, including, you know, certain leaders we have right now, they are so unconsciously dependent on the feminine that they strike out and they do stupid things. And what I've found with, in working with men, that unless we realize how fundamentally dependent we are on the feminine for our very lives, because that's what the feminine is, because in Shiva and Shakti, you know, Shiva isn't, it's just consciousness. It's not even flesh. So, you know, in my tantric tradition, um, the masculine serves the feminine. That's what is done. And that is a reversal of what's going on right now. And that doesn't mean there's not balance in male and female relationships and all sorts of, you know, our unconscious wounds need to be worked out, which of course they do. But <clears throat> the, the masculine now needs to serve the feminine or there won't be any human beings on the planet. The planet will continue to do its thing. There's just not gonna be any human beings on it. The, 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 the earth will take care of herself over time, um, but there won't be human beings, uh, which would be kind of sad. Um, I, I wish for that not to happen. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm very touched by what you're saying, and I'm so glad you're putting it out into the world. and. Um, in corporations where I have been, the whole masculine growth tendency, well, that is about ready to come to an end. We, 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 are, we, are, we are coming to a worldwide economic crisis at some point here because all of our economies are completely out of control and artificially um, um, stimulated by the governments. And that's going to come to an end. And we're going to be in different times. And 
hopefully in those different times, instead of everybody freaking out, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll find some balance. We, we're, we are so, com so completely out of balance in terms of our economics with, with, with oil and gas, with, with the way we're treating the, the planet that mm, she's going to do something. And she is because the other side of the feminine um, and I am no expert in this is Kali. And when Kali rises, all sorts of things begin to happen. And uh, I don't know, those are my thoughts. I'm so glad to be on this, this, this webinar. Thank you, Eric. I uh, deeply resonate with everything you've said. And uh, because one of, you know, my masters are Sri Aurobindo and the mother. Um, they talked about evolution and the arc of evolution at that this moment we find ourselves in history. Um, it's as if things rise to a boiling point in order to create a tip over, like the tipping point. So I would like to think that we have boiled ourselves to that point now. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, it's, we have precipitated this crisis so that we will now be able to transcend it. We will address it. We will not be able to put it off any longer. I like uh, it. We got it. We got it. We, now we got to deal with it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I like that. I like dealing with things. That's good. Yes. And um, Caroline, uh, Caroline Meese, she said something uh, very uh, striking as well. She said, it's as if um, our journey to maturation as, uh, as a species requires to go through the use and abuse of power uh, in order to be able to uh, be worthy of it eventually. You know, so that we need to know, what, you know how much is too much and how, how, how little is too little. And you know, we need to attain a level of competence over it. So now that women have gone through the use and abuse in prehistoric times and men have gone through their use and abuse of it. I would like to think that we also brought ourselves to this precipitation point where here on it becomes whole man, whole woman, one dance, you know, that like there is no win without win-win. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Just a comment there uh, to my two, uh, favorite wise people, Eric and Lima. I, like you, Eric, I've been in the belly of the beast, but as a business person. So all my life, I was a warrior, probably a perfect example of a man warrior. 12 years ago, I discovered that I had a feminine side and I embraced it. I think it made me a much better leader, very caring, and my results were exemplary. But I was eventually fired because of that, because I didn't no longer fit in the system and I refused to to create casualties for no reason. So I agree with you. Uh, in my work, I meet a lot of business people. Most of them are suffering. And I think the current system is completely unsustainable. Completely. It's, it's either going to transform or be destroyed. I mean, it's not, it's not sustainable. Nilima, there's a, someone that asked a question. You, you mentioned an author. Would you repeat the name? Was or maybe they wanted to know your name. <laughs> I'm not sure. It was Chantal Gasselin that asked that. So maybe Chantal, you can type. Yeah. We, we can uh, answer that question. Also. I think it was Bailey yeah. Johnson. Yeah, polarity mapping. Oh, Barry Johnson. Barry Johnson, okay, thank you. Barry thank you Johnson that. and polarity mapping. The organization is called Polarity Partnerships. So it's www.polaritypartnerships.com. Okay, thank you, Nilema. Okay, so we have time for uh, several more questions. So next person. I'd, I'd like to jump in. And I concur with what Stefan has just um, spoke about, was about embracing the feminine. And I'm on that journey as well. And, um, and one of the things that I haven't really, I think, totally embraced was the power of the Shakti energy. And it's kind of, coming up to why am I maybe not embracing it as much as what I could be, understanding how powerful it really is and, uh, and the subtleties that's moving in my own life. Uh, the other thing that I also 
have been a witness and experienced is the dis, uh, dysfunction in business and the abuse of power, the manipulation, the control, and, um, and the energy of getting things done at all costs. And, and uh, the only way to kind of interrupt that kind of uh, mindset and that kind of showing up is calling out that shadow, you know, really calling out the dysfunction and really calling out, you know, how are you actually feeling? You know, and I think that the, the, the biggest problem is the fact that most men are not feeling and they're not coming from their hearts. And most of the corporate culture and business is the same. It's not a heart-based, you know, way of being and um, in relating in the world and being in service to each other. So I have some, um, some challenges around getting a message out and, um, and really calling you know, the voice to this, um, where you're talking about the blending of the masculine family and breaking down that walls. So I'm happy to be here on this call and mm. I totally resonate with uh, what's being shared here and know that um, I'm over, I, I'm being over uh, lighted by the divine feminine and I'm having to sort of step out and, uh, and be a way shower at the same time. You know, Larry, uh, you may enjoy Raj, my co-author Raj's uh, various books, particularly um, Conscious Capitalism that he wrote with John Mackey, mm -hmm. uh, also Firms of Endearment, and uh, Everybody Matters. Uh, these three books speak directly to the business case for having more feminine and more love and care in your culture and your leadership. Um, and that is good for business, but that's not why you do it. You do it because it, it feels good, you know, uh, right through. And uh, it keeps you healthy and sane and uh, creates cultures of meaning and purpose and, uh, you know, creates uh, people who thrive at work. And guess what? You, you are sustainable and profitable hugely as a result. Yeah, I think there's also a, a very good TED Talk, the most recent from Raj. He's actually gone from conscious capitalism, Larry, to uh, the, the healing organizations. Can organizations help people heal? And I have to be very honest because I'm always honest. First time I watched it, I cried. And I told Raj that because I said, he, someone at that level that writes these powerful books gets it. And because uh, a lot of business people are completely uh, uh, wounded, you know. And uh, imagine leadership helping people heal what's possible, you know, and how much uh, gr uh, gratitude people would have towards the leaders and how much results they would generate. I mean, this is it's just, just like a perfect social contract that we could. So I'll just shut up and allow someone else to ask a question. I will be happy to share uh, something. Um, so I will start by saying that um, um, I will enter into my vulnerability to share what I'm feeling and that's what I want to share because I think this is what is being part of the path. Um, regarding our discussion, what I think is the question is how? How do we get to that feminine and, and masculine wedding? And how do we meet and discover each other? And uh, from what I'm living, what I'm learning, it's first of all, it's to uh, detach ourselves from the knowledge because we've been carried so much for a long time by the knowledge, the external knowledge. So the path for me, the step is to first go back inside and just sit in that space and just exploring that space, feel that space, because I think the feminine is uh, living inside us and the guidance, her guidance is from the feeling, from that space of intuition. So what we need first um, is to reconnect by just going back inside of us and find that inner guidance, that inner power that's going to help us then to discover our inspiration, our, our move, 
and from that place let emerge what wants to be done what wants to be created and then the masculine power um, so which is a new challenge for us because as we have been managed by the knowledge and by the control we want to plan everything and what i think is important now it's going back to the presence and the moment presence and just open ourselves to not being guided with having a, a wide overview of how it's going to happen but just come back into the present moment and let us be guided by moment to moment and that's how the masculine will dance by this uh, presence and listening and uh, in that field of unknown, in that field of um, progressive and instant, instant knowledge and guidance. I love what you're saying. One of the things, um, I mean, the way I describe it is, you know, letting go the hold of me and slipping into the flow of Sri, where Sri is this field of Shakti, which is supremely intelligent and has its own grand design where evolution wants to go. And um, it's, it's a field of synchronicity. So when we do the presence practice, we even come with these affirmations that I have nothing to defend, I have nothing to promote, and I have nothing to fear, and all I need comes to me. And then step both feet in to this field of emergent flow and trust that from a moment to moment basis, all you need shows up in that moment. It's like breath, you know, you exhale this breath. You're not worried that, oh, I'm not letting go this breath because who knows where the next one's coming from. You don't, right? It's just natural. So in the same way, you move through your moment to moment uh, in a field of synchronicity. And when you can be sufficiently without fear and anxiety, uh, you then dance with the field, you're in alignment with the field. There are three more statements I'd like to share, which I find are very powerful to disconnect from the old uh, fear-based uh, uh, paradigm. Uh, are the three statements that I am enough, I have enough, and there is enough for everyone in this moment, okay? Because very often we are worrying about somehow scared, the scarcity consciousness or victim consciousness or you know, not unworthiness consciousness. These three statements somehow put us back into a state of presence and um, that moment to moment field of synchronicity uh, is something that we reconnect with. When we can say, I am enough, I have enough, and there is enough for everyone, right? Yeah, you're right. It's a totally different way of living, being, and doing. Right. And the path is going from the head to the heart. So because we've been managed so much a long time by the head, we always think from that space. And the path is to come back to uh, the feeling space, to be guided by the feeling space, and at the same time, let open our mind to other possibilities. Because as we have been managed by the head, we are limited in our way of thinking, of seeing, of creation. So what does it mean that it's been just in a state, in a position of opening, opening to the moment, opening to the feeling, and opening to the possibilities, then it opens our mind to the new, to other possibilities. Yes, and as Eric said earlier, that um, the masculine, or in this case, the mind, is here to serve the intuition or you know, maybe the feminine, which is that you open, you, you receive a higher guidance from your higher mind, but you then also need the mind to be the executive, you know, the, the doer who then goes and creates those actions in a more practical way. So, but the mind will do it in service of and being guided by that presence rather than trying to control and lead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Someone asked a question here, uh, Nilima, on, on the chat. In management or lead positions of leadership, how can one maintain a balance between the feminine and masculine energy? <laughs> you must read the book. It's a very yeah. simple, <laughs> very simple chapter on flexibility and that one polarity map that I was talking about. I've actually created a masculine and feminine polarity map. So you can see what are the positive masculine qualities, what are positive feminine qualities mm -hmm. that you can have. And equally, what happens when you go into hyper-masculine? What's your typical behavior? Mm -hmm. And what happens when you go into hyper-feminine, your typical behavior? And then you learn to catch yourself when you fall into those behaviors. Mm -hmm. And then you identify action steps to bring you back to the healthy aspects of both. So for example, in my case, I discovered that when I become hyper-masculine, I become judgmental. Or when I become hyper-feminine, I become needy, right? And so my, my action step, my return to health, is when I'm becoming judgmental, I've, become, I've got to re, uh, reach for my healthy feminine. So my hyper-masculine has to then get me to reach to healthy feminine. And for me, it is the ability to be compassionate. And that is something I know I can do. I have that capability. So now when I find myself being judgmental, I stop, I catch myself, and I switch to practicing compassion towards that person. Equally, when I find myself getting needy, that's my hyper-feminine self who's given my power away to someone or something and feeling needy, I catch myself and I move to my healthy masculine which is the ability of, by the way, I have a lot of Kali energy. Someone mentioned Kali earlier. So I have the ability for self-care, you know, to really bring on that strong, tough boundary that says this much and no more. You know, here on, I'm going to practice the self-care and you have to take care of yourself, you know. So if I become needy, I do the self-care and meet my needs myself instead of feeling sorry that someone else isn't taking care of me. And that, so, and that might mean quitting your job. Yes, which I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, or, or it might mean, Eric, getting fired because you refuse to do things you no longer are willing to do by selling your soul. You know, there's a lot of... Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. You, know, you get fired. Mm -hmm. Right. And if, you know, if, you get fired, if you get fired in the United States, you get to draw unemployment compensation. Yeah. Well, um, all kinds of things happen if you hang around uh, in a place your higher self and soul doesn't want you to be. You then get kicked out. You know, <laughs> it's like uh, oh, whack therapy, as a friend calls it. And, uh, and then guess what? What seems like a crisis, if you have the mentor and, and, and grace on your side and you stop wallowing in self-pity and take responsibility for yourself and get on with your heroic journey that you've been cast into, uh, you appear on the other side in a whole new wonderful place. So mm -hmm. thank God for my corporate crisis because if that hadn't happened in 1998, 20 years later, I wouldn't be living the life I'm living, which is just, just right for me now. Mm. Yeah, thank God for all the crises we went through. Eh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and there's more to come, I'm sure. So maybe one last question, and then we'll have to wrap up. Some people have to go back to work, and, and the Lima has to go enjoy the eclipse. <laughs> so maybe yes. one last question. Anyone? Comment? No? Yeah, uh, I, I have a question. Um, you were mentioning um, that um, we were in a previous uh, period of time on the matriarchal um, leadership. Um, I was wondering if the fact that um, women give birth and they have to take care of the children, um, if they put them a little bit more away of becoming becoming spiritual for you know taking time for themselves to self-reflect awakening on the enlightenment and uh, you know they become so more needy as well 
I'm uh, I'm sorry, I didn't. Uh, you could you could you explain the question again? I said in that time when the women had more power over men, they had children, and in fact, I'm just wondering how how it's possible that the matriarchal um, leadership uh, rise again because of the fact that women give birth and they have to take care of their children and it's harder for them to have time to self-reflect and you know to to be more spiritual so i would, I mean, uh, I would say that in in today's terms for example i have a 24 and a 27 year old uh, girl and a boy and you know um, i went through the process and uh, life is long and the children grow up and then you get time to do the reflection. Sometimes you do it during the childbirth because that itself becomes an awakening experience. So um, one of the things that we say in yoga is all life is yoga. Whatever experience you're going through, whether it's childbirth, you can lift it and divinize it and turn it into a process of awakening. So being a mother can lead to your enlightenment. Cooking your food can lead to your enlightenment. Uh, doing the dishes can lead to your enlightenment. So it is the attitude with which you are doing what you are doing that turns it into a path to transformation. Um, you, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean to sit and meditate or uh, you know, do yoga on a mat in asanas and so on. So uh, it's simply about reframing what you are doing and turning it into an internal attitude and practice of um, mastering yourself, your emotions, your thoughts, your beliefs. I like that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Your mic's uh, off, Stefan. Oh, sorry, yeah. So I said, Marquilol, did you have a question? Your hand was raised before. No, it was just a, a reflection to say, really, um, I, I'm raising three girls. And to me, that conversation is very enlightening because, and not because just they're girls. And I, I don't wish for a matriarchy to come back. I, I wish for that balance to come back. Yeah. Really. And this is what we have to explain to, to our, our children, I guess. That, um, it, But I like what Martin said, is about stepping back and taking the time to reflect on our actions and what we're doing, whether we're in a corporation, in our own business, in our own family, in a, you know, within our, our entourage. What do we do? How do we react? How can we balance our feminine and masculine side? And to me, conversations like these on a Friday afternoon is a very good thing because then, you know, it gets the conversation going in our family, within our organization, everybody that we, that we meet. How can we balance it out? And I believe, strongly believe that with people like you and Stefan that do that step back think about it and shares that well we can all succeed somehow in 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 helping that you know capitalism and and short-term visions that uh, businesses have put forward in a system that's obviously not working anymore so thank you i just wanted to say i have to run but i just wanted to say it was very enlightening so keep it up do more like this this is very thank you, thank you much Claude. Just for Thank all the you. women there online to give you some hope, uh, I, I attended, Eric knows this organization, I attended a man-only weekend workshop. Around the world, it's called the Mankind Project. It's like a warrior's journey of a weekend. And one of the things we discuss is the feminine and the masculine energy. You know, they don't call it Shiva Shakti, but they do call it feminine and masculine. And for all, uh, the men that were there, 42 men, half of them discovered their strongest energy was feminine. And most of them cried to actually discover that it was okay. And, and so I'm just telling you, in the men community, there's a lot of suffering for not having embraced this feminine side. Because you know the way boys are raised, especially if they play competitive sports, is don't cry, play hurt. And this warriorship is indoctrinated in most men. And for any man to discover that it's okay to embrace the feminine, it's a great day. Because women have already known, especially in business, to embrace the masculine. They know how to do that really, really well. But I think what's been a drama for me in business for 30 years is we promote women, and then we ask them to behave like men.
it's big drama for me. I think we're just, you know, why are we doing that to ourselves? So I just wanted to say that there is a big community of men awakening to this side. They're being very quiet in business because it's seen as a sign of weakness. You know, I've been accused for many years uh, of being weak because I was a very sensitive man. On the other side, I'm also a very good warrior. So I, I, I accept both sides. But it's, it's emerging. And I think like my Claude, I'm one of the biggest uh, promoter of the feminine rise, not only in women, but in men as well. Because I think it just makes everybody whole. And one of the things, my Claude, I realized is that my, I have a daughter who's 14. And I want her to have a successful career, whatever she chooses to be. I want her to go into acting if she chooses to be without threats of being sexually abused. I want her to go work in business and have equal chance of promotion. And I want her to have equal pay, which we don't have in Canada for women. You know, in most countries we don't. Iceland has that, but we certainly don't have it here or in the U.S. Or around. So this is what I'm fighting for. But not only my daughter, obviously, all the future daughters. So, so it is a, something really, really important. And this is why I've latched on to Nilima as my friend, Wisdom. And I love her book and I recommend it deeply because it will change your life. It changed my life. So, so on this note, I want to thank you, Nilima. I don't know if you want to say a few parting words. Just uh, My parting word would be my famous four words, which is the sum and substance of the entire work, which is I wish we all become the wise fool of tough love. Right? So right there are the four archetypes. If you're wise, you access your parent self. If you're foolish, you access your child self. And if you're tough, you access your inner masculine. And if you're love, you access your inner feminine. Mm -hmm. Right there, if you can have access to these four aspects, the wise, fool, of tough, love, I promise ourselves that in every situation, we'll be able to move through with the, with the right skill. One of those is what is going to uh, take us through. So let's cultivate being the wise fool of tough love. I like that. That's good. I, I, I love it too. I, I, I love it. That's good. Yeah, I'm ready for I that. I more than like it. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Nilima. Someone just asked the book. The book I'm referring to is uh, Nilima's book. It's called Shakti Leadership. Just look it up on Amazon. You'll find it. It's a great book. And uh, so thank you, Nilima. Thank you, everyone, for all your, uh, your attention, for joining us on this uh, groundbreaking webinar, and also for your uh, authentic uh, sharing. And uh, so I'm just going to end this call now. It's recorded, so I'll send it all to you guys if you want to listen again. And uh, I wish you an amazing weekend. Thank you, everyone. Wonderful. Bye. Much Bye. love to all of you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.